Have your Bibles turned to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we're going to read verse 16 as our starting point this morning. If I can pick all my stuff up that's falling out of my Bible. John chapter 15, verse 16. And again, if you would please, excuse me, stand for the reading of God's word when you find it. John chapter 15. And verse 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples during the Last Supper, and he says the following You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask the Father, in my name, he may give you. Jesus, talking to his apostles, there in the upper room on the night before he was arrested and then subsequently crucified the next day, Jesus is talking to them and he makes a very plain statement. He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You know, when you think about the stories of the apostles and the disciples, not a single one of them approached Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, I've seen some of the stuff that you're doing. It's pretty awesome. And I think it would be cool if I could be one of your, one of your 12 apostles. Would, would you let me do that? That didn't happen, did it? They didn't choose him. He chose them. I think that there is an important truth there that not only will apply to our sermon today, but that applies to this entire series that we are wrapping up today called The Chosen church we'll talk about it more when we dig into scripture father god thank you for today thank you for this opportunity to open and study your word i pray that as we do so you would hinder satan from this place and his influence that you would allow our minds to concentrate solely on the word of god as it is being proclaimed lord i pray that we would hear it myself included that it would take root in our hearts and our souls, and that we would be changed by it, that we might be more like Jesus Christ. For we ask it in His mighty name. Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back to Genesis, the end of chapter 49. We did not quite finish Genesis chapter 49 last week, and so we're going to finish it and then do chapter 50 today as we wrap up the book of Genesis and we wrap up our series, The Chosen Church. I have titled the message today, appropriately enough, The End of an Era. Because with today's sermon, we will come to the conclusion of the patriarchal age of Jewish history. We've been talking about it since May, as we've worked our way through this extensive series in the book of Genesis. If you remember at the end of last week's message, Jacob was blessing his sons. Jacob was pronouncing blessings over them. You can go back and look at chapter 49 and reread some of the things that we talked about last week as a reminder if you like, but Jacob's blessings were prophetic in nature. They they described not just Jacob's sons per se, but the families that would be derived from each of his sons, the, the tribes of people that each of his sons would father, became known by the characteristics talked about in Jacob's blessing of his sons. If you remember, Jacob was extremely ill when he made these prophecies. Joseph had brought his own two sons with him to go visit his father because the report was that Jacob was on his deathbed That time was short. And Jacob gathered his family together. 
and mustered all of the remaining strength that he had left. And he pronounced the blessings that we talked about last week over his sons and his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh as well. So let's begin this morning where we left off last week. Right at that point, they're all gathered in the room. They're all there. Jacob has just finished blessing his sons. And we'll pick up the first point this morning, which is called Jacob Dies. We're in verse 29 of chapter 49. Then he, Jacob, charged them and said to them, I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite for a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. An expression that means he passed away. By the way, that phrase gathered with his people, inherent to that phrase is the idea that we go be with our loved ones in glory, right? Gathered to his people. That's a neat phrase that we think about. Well, with his last fleeting breaths, the last words that he uttered, Jacob commanded his sons, who were all gathered there together, to bury him in Canaan. He wanted to be laid to rest in the cave of Machpelah, which we have talked about throughout this year. It was located in the field that his grandfather Abraham had purchased all of those chapters before, all of those years earlier, from Ephraim the Hittite. Abraham... had purchased the cave, if you remember, as a burial site when his wife Sarah died. Abraham buried Sarah there, and then when Abraham died, his boys buried him there beside her. When Isaac died, Abraham's son, he was buried there, it says, as well as his wife, Rebekah. They were both buried there. And Jacob says that Leah is buried there. Leah being one of Jacob's wives, the mother of six of his children. Leah, he would have buried there personally himself. She likely died in the land of Canaan before they even moved to Egypt. And he was saying, she's laying there as well. And right beside her, there's a spot waiting for me. <laughs> and when I die, which is imminent, I don't want to be buried here in Egypt where we are now. I want you to take my body back to my ancestral homeland and bury it with my grandparents and my parents and my wife. I want to be buried in the family grave. And after making his final request, Jacob laid back in his bed, drew up his feet, curled up, and died. Scripture tells us, not here but elsewhere, that he was 147 years of age when he passed away. With his passing, <coughs> came the end of the patriarchs. Jacob was the last of the patriarchs. Joseph, although we have talked a lot about him, was not technically a patriarch. The patriarchs were those who were chosen of God 
specifically in exclusion to their brothers. God called a man named Abram, changed his name to Abraham, but God called Abraham. God didn't call Abraham's brothers. God called Abraham and said, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. Abraham had two sons, and actually more after that in his old age, but he had Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael, though he would become a great nation, was not chosen. Isaac was chosen. At the exclusion of his brothers, Isaac was chosen. Through his line and his line only, God's people, Israel, would be perpetuated. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau was not chosen. Sure, he had sons, sure, he had descendants, and sure, they became a great people. But they were not God's chosen people. Jacob was chosen. And God's covenant promises continue through Jacob. But with Jacob, it stops. Because Jacob had 12 sons, and although some were more uh, prominent than others, and God, although it would seem, at least in earthly terms, that God's favor was upon more uh, some than others, all of them were equally recipients of the Abrahamic covenant. There was no more choosing of a particular son. So Joseph was not a patriarch. He was not chosen as the only one among his brothers through whom the line of God would continue. Or through, the, through whom the chosen people of God, the Abrahamic covenant, would continue. All of his brothers shared mutually in that. So the, the patriarchs are specifically Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And from Jason, Jacob, father, going on down, all of Jacob's descendants through any of his sons would be the people of God, the Hebrews. God's covenant began with Abraham. It was established in the lines of Isaac and Jacob. And even though all of these 12 sons of Jacob had their own distinct identities, and although their tribes would have their own distinct identities and characteristics, together, together collectively, they were all Hebrews, and they all collectively made up the nation of Israel. Well, let's move into chapter 50. The second point this morning is called Returned to Canaan. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 50. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants and physicians to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel, that is Jacob. Now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him for seventy days. And when the days of mourning for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die in, the, in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now therefore, please let me go up and bury my father and then I will return. And Pharaoh said, Go and bury your father he, as he has made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all of the household of Joseph, <coughs> excuse me, and his brothers and his father's household. They left only their little ones and their flocks and their herds in the land of Goshen. And they all went up both horsemen and chariots, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan. They lamented there with a great sorrow, full lamentation, and he observed seven days of mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore it was named Abel Mizraim, which is in, beyond the Jordan. Those first few verses we read there of chapter 50 tell us what happened in the immediate aftermath of Jacob's death. Jacob died, and Joseph began to weep and kissed his body. We've seen throughout this series that Joseph was an emotional person. 
He wept multiple times upon seeing his brother, upon seeing his father, upon seeing Benjamin specifically. When his father died, he, he weeped. And in the hours that followed, he ordered the physicians to embalm Jacob's body according to the Egyptian custom. Now, this process took a while. It said it took 40 days to complete the tedious process of embalming. Meanwhile, the Egyptians were mourning Jacob's death for 70 days, and I'm sure those, those days coincided. I'm sure there wasn't 40 days and then 70 days. There was 70 days. The first 40 they were embalming during the mourning period. Nevertheless, what we see here is that all of Egypt is mourning Jacob's death. Joseph, the prince of Egypt, held such high esteem within the nation that even though his father was a, a, a foreigner from the land of Canaan who had just moved there 17 years earlier, out of respect for Joseph, who was a royal dignitary, second in charge to Pharaoh, there was a national period of mourning for Jacob. After this time period ended, Pharaoh had given Jacob, Joseph permission to go bury his father per his request in Canaan, the ancestral homeland of his people. So, Joseph and his family, along with, by the way, you may have seen there, many Egyptians, Many of the Egyptians joined this procession and they all left for the land of Canaan together. Along the way, they stopped at a location named in Scripture as the threshing floor of Atad. Now, there are various instances in the Bible where we see uh, threshing floors. Threshing floors were, of course, uh, uh, flat areas, usually of, of large stones, in which they would bring in the, the, the harvest, the, the wheat and the grain, and they would throw it all in there, and then they would manually go through and thresh the wheat or thresh the grains because there were no machines back in those days that did that. So it was a threshing floor to where they could get the grains off the stalks. And it was a good flat place where you could stop and you could camp. And they stopped there at the threshing floor of Atad. The exact site of this place is, is unknown even to this day. We, we're not sure exactly where it is, but most scholars suggest that it's probably on the border between Egypt and Canaan. They came to the border and they, and they stopped. And they observed another seven day, according to the Jewish, Jewish tradition, another seven days of weeping, of sorrow, of lament. And their sorrow was so great that the Canaanites who lived in the area saw the Egyptians in mourning along with Joseph and his family, but saw the Egyptians particularly sad and sorrowful, and they renamed that location Abel Misrium, which means the mourning, with a U, like sadness, mourning of Egypt. That's what a bell misrium means. I don't know, I don't think it is, but I don't think this, this word is the source of our English word misery, but it sure does sound a lot like it, misrium. There was misery and sadness. Notice also in these verses we read that Joseph's body was embalmed according to the Egyptian custom. See, the reality is that the Hebrews, the Jewish people, do not typically embalm their dead, even to this day. In fact, it's against their law, the religious law, to do so. Instead, Jewish people bury the deceased within 24 hours after they, de they die. They bury them as quickly as possible for obvious reasons. If you're not going to embalm the dead body, then it's not going to take very long before it begins to decompose, 
It begins to stink. And remember the story of Lazarus? What were they concerned about? That the body had already begun to decompose and stink. When they buried Jesus, they took him off the cross and they buried him <laughs> within a matter of hours. Jewish people don't wait two, three, four days to bury someone. Typically, they bury them as quickly as possible within 24 hours. Even to this day. But because they embalmed Jacob's body, then obviously it was preserved for a much longer period of time. And this preservation allowed for them to mourn for 70 days, and it also permitted them to be able to take Jacob's body intact from Egypt on the long journey back to Canaan and bury him there. Let's look at his burial. Buried in Canaan. Our third point this morning, starting in verse 12. Thus his sons did for him, just as he had charged them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham had bought, along with the field, a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? <coughs> so they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged us before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did wrong. And now please forgive their transgression." of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said, Do, I, do not be afraid, for I am I God in your place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. When this great procession finally arrived at the cave of Machpelah near the city of Hebron in Israel, Joseph and his brothers buried their father there in the cave of the patriarchs just as he had requested. Abraham and his wife, Isaac and his wife, and now Jacob and his wife, all three of the patriarchs and their wives buried in this location, a holy site. When the burial was complete, they all returned to their homes in Egypt. And in the days that followed, Joseph's brothers began to fear that now that Jacob had passed away and he was no longer present with them that Jacob might oh, I'm sorry that Joseph might still hold a grudge against them for what they had done to him all of those years ago when they were just youth now they had already dealt with this issue once before Back during their second visit, and Joseph revealed himself to them, and they experienced a time of reconciliation. But the brothers thought in their mind, maybe the only reason Joseph forgave us is because Dad was still alive, and he did it for Dad. But now that Dad is not alive anymore, Perhaps Joseph still holds a grudge. And so, out of concern that something might happen to them, they sent word to Joseph and they said, Jacob, our father, said before he died to please forgive your brothers. 
Now that may or may not have happened. It doesn't say in the scripture. They may have just completely made that up to try to, to try to get themselves out of trouble again. But nevertheless, the report was made. Dad said before he died that you need to forgive us and not hold a grudge against us. And then the brothers came and bowed down before him humbly again in reverence to Joseph, hoping to quell any possible grudge that he might be holding. And once again, we see Joseph weeping. He weeps this time, most likely because his brothers still can't accept the fact that he has forgiven them. <laughs> I mean, think about it. That was 17 years ago that he had forgiven them and then invited them to move to Egypt so he could take care of them, invited his father to move to Egypt, settled them in the very best land in all of Egypt, and for all this time he has been providing for them and making sure that they're taken care of and they're and they're successful and they're prospering and they're, and they're doing well. And yet, through all of this goodwill that he has showed them, somehow his brothers still in the back of their mind wonder if he truly forgives them or not. And Jacob tells his brothers, listen, I forgive you. I have forgiven you. I still forgive you. It's water under the bridge. We're done with it. And what he says here is what he said previously. He says, what you meant for evil, God worked out for good. What you did for me out of anger and malice, God has transformed into something good. And because of it, Many people have survived and lived through the famine that, that had occurred. I was in place as God intended so that not only would the nation survive, but you specifically would survive. God is in control. And therefore, I trust in Him and I don't hold a grudge against you. And He forgave them yet again. As we come to the final section of the chapter in, in the book, the last point is called Joseph dies. Joseph dies. Verse 22 and following. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Mac. The son of Manasseh were born with Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but surely God will take care of you and bring you up from the land to, to the place that he has promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. If you do all the little math and, and figure out all the different details of, of when so-and-so was born and when their father died and, and when this one was born and what happened, you can determine that Joseph was likely in his mid-50s, was in his mid-50s, when Jacob, his father, died, we just read about. And then it says that Joseph died when he was 110, which tells me that Joseph lived for another 54 approximately years after Jacob, his father, died. And so between the burial and the death of Jacob in the first part of the chapter to the death of Joseph mentioned in the last part of the chapter, 54 years passes. Now the Bible doesn't give us any details <coughs> about what happened during those 54 years other than the fact that Joseph, and, and by the way, all of the other brothers as well, but Joseph's family grew during that time. Joseph lived long enough, it says, 
to see three generations of his sons. In other words, he had Ephraim, and then Ephraim had sons, and then perhaps even those sons had sons. He saw great-grandchildren and perhaps great-great-grandchildren, depending on how you interpret that, not just for Ephraim, but for Manasseh. His families grew, and he lived a long time to see the offspring of his children a few generations. Near the end of his life, Joseph reassures his brothers of two things. First, that God would take care of them. That God would provide for them. That God would continue to watch over them even after Joseph had died and was gone. God was still present. It says Joseph said this to his brothers, but I think the word brothers there needs to be understood from the standpoint he was talking to his brethren, to his family. Joseph was one of the youngest of the 12 brothers, remember? He was the 11th of 12 born. So it is likely that some of his older brothers had already died by this point. Can't say that for sure, but it's certainly probable. He was talking to his family. And he was telling them, all of these years I've been in charge, I've been taking care of you. God's been taking care of you through me. But even with my passing, don't worry, God will continue to watch out for you. And then the second thing he says is, he reminds them that someday God would lead the Hebrew people back to the land of Canaan, which he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Someday, maybe not today, but someday God will take the Hebrew people out of Egypt and he will bring them back to the promised land. And then Joseph made a request similar to the request that his father Jacob had made. He said, and when that day comes, Please take my body back with you and bury it in Canaan. When Joseph died, the Egyptians embalmed his body just as they had done to Jacob's body and they placed it in a coffin and it remained there in that coffin for almost 400 years until the time of the Exodus, when, by the way, trivia fact, Moses and the Hebrew people took Joseph's body, per his request, to Canaan during the Exodus and buried it there. I would imagine when Joseph died, it was a royal uh, funeral. You know, sometimes we can see on the History Channel or maybe in, in movies, even though they're fiction, how the Egyptians, you know, boy, they, they would bury their pharaohs in these elaborate coffins and, and they would put things in there, you know, because they believed in all these pagan, uh, like they could take it with them or something. And, you know, the, the pyramids that we see in Egypt were actually crypts where they put, you know, pharaohs and, and all of this stuff. I would imagine Joseph had a royal burial. And his body was embalmed according to the Egyptian tradition. And I'm sure all of these things were probably put in, in, a, in a, great, a great shrine or a great, uh, uh, um, can't think of the word, but crypt was built for him and he was placed in it. And there his body lay for almost 400 years in an Egyptian coffin. Joseph was not one of the patriarchs. I mentioned that earlier. But nevertheless, the book of Genesis gives a lot of chapters to him. I think there are multiple reasons for this. Number one, if you don't have Joseph's story, you don't have the background information needed to see how the, the Hebrew people got from Canaan to Egypt. Joseph's story gives us the, the backdrop for how God's people got 
came to live in Egypt, which sets up for the Egyptian captivity, which we begin to read about in Exodus and follow. The second reason I think that we have Joseph's story laid out for us in so much detail when he is not technically one of the patriarchs is because Joseph's story, unlike any of the others, clearly and repeatedly points to Jesus. We've talked about it throughout this series, how there are so many parallels that can be made between Joseph's life and his experiences and that of the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ. And listen, ultimately, though we read stories about all of these different people, and though we read different teachings and different verses, ultimately, the entire Bible is about Jesus. It's either pointing to him, the Old Testament, it's talking about him, the Gospels, or it's pointing back to what he's done, the epistles and the rest of the New Testament. It's all about Jesus. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see Joseph's story elaborated on so much in Genesis. Well, we've come to the end of the book. We've come to the end of the age. And with the few minutes left that I have this morning, I want to wrap up this series by repeating and going over a few of the major, major points that I think we could get from these messages. First of all, prior to the age of the patriarchs, in the time between the Garden of Eden all the way up to Abraham, during those years prior to the age of the patriarchs, there was no designated people of God. Instead, during that time period, God revealed himself to individuals and families that were scattered across the earth, including faithful men such as Abel, such as Enoch, such as Noah. <laughs> we know the story of Noah. Such as Job. Job, I'll use this as an example. Noah, you could say the same thing, and I'm sure probably these others. He was the father, and, and he, uh, as the head of the family, led his whole family to faith. Or at least he tried to. But during this time period, before the age of the patriarchs, believers were not a collective group. They didn't come together for church, or they didn't go to a synagogue collectively. They were, for the most part, largely disconnected from one another. And this approach starkly changed when God chose a man named Abraham, Abram originally, to become the father of his representative people group. And the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were set apart to serve as God's representatives on the earth. They were chosen to be God's people. In keeping with this arrangement, God established the Abrahamic covenant. It consisted of three main parts. One, God would bless Abraham and his descendants and grow them into a populous and prosperous nation. It took some miraculous work to do that. For example, barren women in old age having children. But God kept his promise to Abraham and to his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. Second, God will give these Hebrews the land of Canaan as an eternal possession from which they could live and serve God forever. The land of Israel is the only plot of ground on the earth that God has formerly deeded to a particular people. And it is their possession, and it is their possession forever. And I don't care how loud other people scream, and how unfair other people say, it may be. I don't care what the UN says, I don't care what the Palestinians say, or the Jordanians say, or the Syrians say, or the Lebanese say, or Hamas says, or any other group. God has given the land of Israel specifically to his covenant people, Israel. 
and it is theirs, and it is theirs forever. Three, through Israel, God would work to bless the entire world. It was never God's intention for the people of Israel to hoard God to themselves. Never. It was always their intention to make God's name known in the earth, to make him famous among the people of the earth. Read the book of Ezekiel sometime, again and again and again. It says that they might know that I am the Lord God, speaking to the whole world. God chose to facilitate his name through Israel that they might reach the entire world. And by and large, beloved, the Jewish people failed to do that. Following the age of the patriarchs, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as I've said, were enslaved by the Egyptians for almost 400 years. And during that time, several generations passed and they multiplied into a large ethnic group estimated to be in the millions by the time of the Exodus. And the growth of their people, despite the hardships that they endured, was consistent with God's covenant promise. And all of these things took place just as God had predicted they would to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15. Mm -hmm. So as we come to the end of the era, era, the patriarchal era, I will close with the final point. I think it's on the back of your bulletin there. Again and again in this series, we have seen that the patriarchs were not paragons of virtue by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> These guys were imperfect. They were sinners just like you and me. They were not chosen because of any moral excellence or any superiority on their part. They were chosen solely based on God's sovereign will for reasons, to be quite honest with you, that we don't fully understand. Now there's a lot of different opinions out, out there about why God chose them, but the honest answer is we don't fully understand the mind of God. We can have our hunches, but the fact is God chose Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and why he chose them, I don't know. But he did. And even though they were broken people, even though they were corrupted people, even though they failed again and again, they accepted God's choice and they trusted in him and they placed their faith in him and they obeyed him. And thus they became the patriarchs and the people of God. The patriarchs were chosen by God to become the fathers of his special people. And in the same way, beloved, we as Christians today, the church, we as the church today do not choose God on our own prerogative. We do not cho choose God based on our own initiative or based on our own effort. God chooses us. He chooses us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And it is, our, it is our onus to either reject or accept his choice of us. No one on their own initiative would ever choose God. We're all sinners. Yeah. But God chooses us and he affords us the opportunity to receive his grace. And his salvation. And he chooses us not just arbitrarily, but he chooses us with a specific task. I choose you, Christian. I choose you, church. And if you will accept my calling, then you also accept my commission. To do just as I told Israel to do years ago. To be a blessing to the world. By sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation he offers in word and deed, to be the salt, to be the light, to be the city on the hill, 
to bless the entire world. Listen, the Jews can still participate in that through Christ. I like to think of the covenant not as being changed, but as being extended. And now we, the church, bear the responsibility in the New Testament age of being God's ambassadors and representatives on earth. We are the chosen church. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this series of messages. The many lessons we've learned as we've gone through them. God, I pray that today we would realize, Lord, that you have chosen us. You first loved us. You gave yourself for us. You alone make salvation wholly possible. And as your chosen people, God, it is our obligation and our delight to accept the calling that you've given us, to abide by it, and to be your representative people, your church, your body on the earth until you come again. Help us realize our task. Help us embrace our task. Help us love our task. Help us have the courage to do it. For we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.